Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize, and the ranks of the resistance against Mystery of Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 340. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIBS studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hey, everybody. Good to be back in the studio and, and talking to you guys. Um, this has been quite a month, hasn't it? You know, I've always told everybody, sweetheart, that February and August are, you. if you had any connection to the occult at any time, these will be such rough months for you. You're going to feel pressure. There's There's dates that we don't even understand, I think, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Well, you know, we're watching this whole thing develop with Russia yeah. and uh, and NATO and uh, possibility of war there. It looks like that uh, in Canada, uh, they have basically become a totalitarian communistic state overnight. And, uh, I mean, just some of the things that we're hearing that uh, UN troops have invited in, uh, helping with policing, even though none were needed, they're seizing the funds of not only uh, the truckers involved, but anybody that donated uh, that was Canadian. They're seizing all their money, even if it's a, uh, in, in one uh, situation I saw, it was a, a single mother working to feed her kids, and she donated a few dollars, seized everything that they had. And uh, you know, when you look at the premiers in Canada, say this was not necessary, that they already had the power they needed to bring everything under control. And so it was one of the major power grabs. I think it's a, a very possibly what he was trained to do at Devos. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're setting these things into motion. I, I think he's setting up Canada for the Great Reset. Oh, for sure. And we've we got to keep the Canadians in our prayers. Um, this is really rough on the folks that are, are trying to just have peaceful protests. And you know how the media does. They try to make it look like it's a bunch of crazies. But these are just these are just Canadians that that want freedom and are are tired of the the tyranny, just like we are in the United States. And uh, but they're they're really cracking down and making it hard on them through their. I think they're closing some bank accounts and just all kinds of things. When you and there's been many reports come out that it was the police that were the ones that were trying to elicit a response so that they could have excuse to get rougher. Uh, there were also provocateurs. Uh, that were kind of set in, kind of like how you have Antifa and stuff here. Mm -hmm. And these people gathered together and quickly shut them down because they they maintained, uh, tried to maintain peace in in that situation, Mm -hmm. regardless of what the police were doing, regardless of what the provocateurs were doing. And there were actually more prayer meetings and song services going on during that. Well, I think they were singing the Canadian anthem. National anthem. You told me a story about Carl Koch that was... Yeah, years years ago they had uh, you know said you know the name of God couldn't be used in the public place or something like that, and so Carl Cloak flew to Canada and stood on the steps of their nation's capital and sang their national anthem and got arrested for singing their national anthem <laughs> because, because it, mentions it, God. it mentions God. <laughs> and uh, guys, it's uh, the the world has gone crazy, but it's 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 crazy with a purpose because whatever whenever there is chaos. The Bible says there is every evil work, mm-hmm. and they need chaos. It, it's a Masonic principle that they can only bring their new order out of the chaos that they create. And so uh, we, we need to begin really seeking the face of God. The Holy Spirit stops chaos. When you, when you, when you, especially when you read in Hebrew, uh, Genesis uh, 2, and I, I taught on this on um, oh, it was one of the True Legends conferences, that you have Tohu and Bohu. In the in Genesis two two, which may very well be entities, chaos. One's chaos, and one is 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 unreality. And what contained them was the Bible says that the Spirit of God hovered over the planet. Mm. And so, what we need to pray is that there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit over Canada. There would yes. be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit over the Ukraine. There yes. would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit over Russia. There's going to be an out, yeah. outpouring of the Holy Spirit well, we over America. That, Father. Father, over the nations. Yes. Father, we just ask yes, that the, just like on the original day of Pentecost, Father, let there be a tangible manifestation of your Spirit being poured out on all flesh. Father, your word promises that your Spirit would be poured out on all flesh, not just the flesh 
flesh that was in your kingdom, but the flesh that was trying to move in chaos. And Father, we believe that your spirit can stop chaos dead in its tracks. Mm -hmm. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, the body of Christ comes together, and we bind up the spirit of chaos. We bind up confusion and chaos right now, tohu and bohu, in the name of Jesus, and we forbid them to operate in the earth. But Father, we ask that kingdom order would come, kingdom order, and level heads, Father, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Uh, We did get to to meet with the contractor and picked out the... Uh, cabinets for over at the conference center um i think it's going to look really great uh, and the good news is is he originally had <laughs> just calculated the cabinets for all around the kitchen and so he didn't um we had a lot of stuff there <laughs> that where yeah. the cabinets aren't going to be so that's going to be and, and yeah and so the good news is that sinks that cost is probably going to be cut in half, which will help offset some of the increase in the uh, materials. Materials as well as some of the other stuff that we need to get. Uh-huh. And, and we found out that quartz countertops are almost the exact same price as those yeah, and that's uh, for Michael. Much so preferable. Going, so we're going with quartz. we got to yeah. go out and pick those out in the flooring here in a couple of weeks. So we're, we're excited. And thank you, guys, all our faithful supporters of this ministry at you know, you would think in a time like this, and there's so much uncertainty and and everything that's happened, that the donations would go down, but they've actually went up, and we are so thankful and praising God every day. We're, we thank Him every day for every faithful uh, partner at this ministry for praying for us. We could not make it without your prayers. It's so no. important, um, and we just are, are so grateful, and we want you to know that we're praying for you. We got my prayer book we lay hands on and uh, a lot of times the holy spirit will bring some somebody specific to mind somebody that's struggling in an area and right now mike there's so many people struggling this is like one of the worst months that we've seen and i've heard other ministers saying the same thing with with the death of christians and uh sickness and we're we're really under yeah, attack we are but you know god's revealing revealing the secrets of the enemy and i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute and uh, I think that doesn't mean that these things cannot be turned around, uh, that God's not done with us yet, that God has a plan. There's nothing the enemy does that takes God by surprise. When you understand the nature of God, you know, God has already filled all your tomorrows, guys. He's already been there. He already knows everything the enemy's going to do to try to, mm-hmm. to get you, if you will. And he's already been there. And the Bible says he has already made a way of escape. And... Uh, Guys, we need to trust in God more than ever before, and we need we need to have a knowledgeable confidence in Him, and I I think that's where we have uh, really uh, in the past couple of generations we've lost a lot of the knowledge of God. I, I tell Mary all the time when I want to read something in depth, I'll go back to the 19th and 18th century in the church because boy, there's meat there, and there's there's no cotton candy. But uh, we have the, the priest of the darkness has infiltrated our seminaries, have infiltrated the pulpits, and they have really lowered the bar. You know, in Spurgeon's day, the average sermon was between two and a half to three hours long. Now, I know that that's, that's kind of hard to believe, but the people were hungry for the word and they needed the in-depth training. And today we try to compress it all into a one-hour service. And we wonder why we have anemic Christians. And guys, we, we need to turn this thing around. We, the Word of God reveals who God is. And the more that we understand Him, the more we can see Him activated in our lives, the more in the midst of the storm we can have confidence because we know our God. Mm-hmm. We know Him. Yeah, that's the key, is knowing, knowing Him, knowing His character, His nature, which is revealed in the Word. Because you know he's not going to go against his nature. He's yeah. not going to go against what he's written in his word. Imagine the Apostle Paul. Okay, he's, he's, he's in a boat. He's a prisoner. There's this huge storm coming up. And Mary, in the midst of that storm, he can tell the captain, I've prayed you're going to lose the ship, but not one life is going to be lost. In the midst of the storm, and he's not a hand working trying to save the boat. He's, 
He's chained to something as a prisoner. And yet in that circumstance, he can intercede and save all the lives and hear God. And then when he gets on the island, they're sitting there around the fire and a viper comes up and bites him and everybody's waiting for him to drop dead. And instead he looks at them and starts preaching the gospel. I mean, you want you want to talk? I, I bet that altar call had a one hundred percent conversion rate around that fire. <laughs> that's, guys, that's the that every single one of us have the potential of moving in that way. Mm-hmm. Every single one of us, uh, you know. I, I was thinking about the charismatic movement when it first began uh, yesterday, and it took. The concept of God being able to be able to only move through a few. You know, the, those in the fivefold ministry, those that, you know, when you look at like the healing revivals of the, the, the 40s and the 50s, it was like there was the select few, Mary, that only God could move through. In the charismatic movement, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden the body of Christ learned God can use me. And nobody's were praying for impossible situations and people were being raised from the dead. People were coming up out of wheelchairs. Cancers were drying up. People were being healed and restored because Mm -hmm. the truth is God in me is greater than the situation around me. That's right. And I think somehow or another over the years, we've, we've, we've kind of lost when the Apostle Paul, and he was talking about the time of, of the son of perdition coming up and how this Antichrist spirit was coming up and in the last days. And then in the midst of this, he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's right. No matter what the enemy does, God's greater. Yes, and he it's, is. And it's looking unbelievable here lately, you know. But um, did you want to give some news things before I... No, I, I think we already kind of covered everything we were going to cover. That's that. Okay. That was for you. Oh, okay. And then we're we're going to go on. I, we've got a an ad at the end of this for uh, Hear the Watchman. We'll also the the the, the code to save you twenty dollars if you're wanting to go to Hear the Watchman is Lake Twenty saves you twenty dollars on your tickets. And we we'll, we got an ad at the but we got we're going to put on the end of it that also okay. has that on there to remind everybody. Well, I wanted to talk about um, what today is. This is. Um, February 22nd, 2022. And, um, you know, I've heard several people talking about that. I've even heard Christians talking about it and how how God's told them certain things like um, sent them to scriptures that were like 222 and things like that. There's lots of, of Christians that I've heard say that God wakes them up at 333, 220. Well, I don't believe that that's coming from God. That was part of my programming. Same times I ever woke up, it, it was involved in the programming. It's just like how they use scriptures that, um, in my opinion, and I think it, I think it's got some really good backup, that those scriptures were numbered for Freemason use. Yeah, they, they, it was Sir Francis Bacon and his band of merry men that actually did the numbering system for the King James. And so Bible. when so when you take like uh, a chapter two, verse twenty two, a lot of times people will think that that's God showing them something, but it's it's actually being broadcast from the enemy. And I know that's hard for people to believe, but there is so much that is set up. It's almost like that Matrix movie. Remember where we're on the, the Matrix movie and all those numbers are falling down and things like that, and everything's established through a numerical sequence. And um, I believe that the occult have taken a numerical system that I believe was given to them by the Nephilim to build great occult power, and we wouldn't know about it and actually flow with it because we're on a numbering system, a date system, a timing system, totally outside of God's kingdom. Yeah. And so today is called, it's what's called a palindrome. And it's also an ambigram, which means it reads the same left to right, right to left, and when turned upside down. That's the ambigram part. Um, And also called Tuesday, T-W-O-S-D-A-Y, and it falls on a Tuesday. (laughs) Now and you know, remember, 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. These are all pagan, mm-hmm. pagan timing, pagan names. Um, now, the last time this happened was in 1011, but after today, it will never happen again. So any time that you have specific things like this, oh, the occult will use they, it. they use it because it, it's they use it because they can take the numbers. And I believe the Nephilim showed them how to, to take numerical sequences um, and open portals. Um, the term palindrome came from a man named Henry Peacham many, many years ago. And I looked up, first thing I looked to see if he was a Freemason, and and I didn't see that he was, although he's connected to a lot of the Freemason texts. He wrote a a book called The Complete Gentleman's Guide or something like that that was supposed to enhance the arts, the crafts, and things. And so if if the Freemasons um, esteem him, there's a really good chance he was one. And I, I just didn't have the time to deep search that. Um, but he, uh, there was an article I found about Henry Peacham, and it says this article investigates the presence of a concealed and previously undetected numerical symbolism in a Stuart, Stuart era emblem book, and it's Henry Peacham's Minerva Britanna. So anytime you find things like this, and you can make these connections, I can guarantee you that the occult are all over this day. They're, they're taking all of these numbers. See, I think they can take numbers and open up portals. Because it's, remember, you know, I've said this before. I think um, algebra and geometry are, are from the Nephilim. I really do. You know, there's a basic number system from God. And, and the wonders of God's numbering system is math has absolutes and it makes sense. When you start doing algebra and geometry and these high level things i am telling you it will twist your brain <laughs> mm-hmm. and part of it is because it it's outside i truly believe it is outside of god's kingdom it's like the, like they said a previously undetected numerical symbolism and they and when that's why like you know you take a pentagram a hexagram all these things they're they're diametrically established with angles and, and perfect um, geometric shapes because they use that. The occultists found out how to use that to open portals to create um, occult power. And I think that there's there's probably why one of the reasons why February is so, is so intense on top of the fact that there's Candlemas and Valentine's Day, which is Pagan Day, um, is the fact that it's, it's the shifting month because you're either going to have 28 days or 29 and even things as simple as that, they know how to configure these things and and bring in occult power. So to counter this today, I ask forgiveness for the sins of Henry Peacham and any other person, of the Freemasons and everyone that has been used by the Nephilim to take this hidden numerical system and create occult power for the kingdom of darkness. Father, forgive those sins. Break that occult power right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, we just ask that it would be destroyed, that every structure made out of these numerical sequences would be would be destroyed, that every stronghold created would fall, that everything being used right now to foment war and uh, get through this, this whole agenda, this satanic agenda, Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus over it that destroys every work of darkness. We declare that this is a day of, that you have made. And we rejoice in that fact that you are greater than all of these occult workings that they've done. That you and your people, as we cry out to you and give you praise and glory, as the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that there is none like you could even stand close to you. And we declare that these numbers mean nothing in your kingdom. Yes. This date means nothing in your kingdom. This this palindrome means nothing in your kingdom. And Father, I even ask you forgive the sins of those that, that think that this is, is from you and are unknowingly being a part of it. Father, just let your mercy cover that so that they would not be attacked if this thing falls to the ground. Father, disconnect all the people connected to it so they aren't harmed when this thing falls to the ground today. And I command this structure, you come down in the name of Jesus. 
That's right. And Father, we just ask that you would set your people free, break the attacks coming against them, against their bodies, against their their minds, against their emotions. And Father, just um, strengthen the, the sheaths that are around the nerves. Father, I feel like that, that there's just an attack against nervous systems and and uh, stability. And I just, just speak stability over the body of Christ, over all those that, that call on you. Father, those that are of the remnant that you have, have raised up for this hour, that are born for this day, for this purpose. And we just declare that we come into agreement with your timing. And we declare your timing overrides and overthrows every occult numerical sequence. In Jesus' name. Yes, Father. You know, yesterday I was driving over to the office and God spoke something to me several times. And, and I mean, it was just as clear as anything. The Holy Spirit rose up and said, the tragedy is superficial faith. And I'm thinking, why? And he said, the tragedy of superficial faith. Have you ever known anybody that was superficial? Mm-hmm. That uh, really was a, a, a bad person trying to act nice? and it's almost sickening, uh, or that you uh, go and, let's say you go to the uh, furniture store and you pay high dollar for something that's supposed to be solid wood, and you get it home and it's veneer. That's that very thin layer of fake over the top of it. And I I think that in our generation, and with what they have done uh, in the church, uh, we have a lot of superficial faith in believers that's just kind of razor thin. And I I think it almost goes back, you know, that that dream that I had. In fact, the uh, video that I just posted uh, yesterday uh, to YouTube, we were able to get it up uh, last Friday, dealing on uh, getting yourself untangled from the tentacles of Babylon Part 2. God gave me a dream. And I, I think that hotel that I was talking about represents the church. Okay, that I mean, there was there was a lot of marble, a lot of granite. I mean, just a lot of solid things. You the that building was built upon a solid rock, but the individual rooms represented the lives of the people that were staying there. That we have people in the church that have no foundation. They're still on the sand, and you see, heaven nor hell cares about the name of the church that you belong to, or how superpowered your pastor is, or all these things, because it yeah, everything in the Word of God goes back to the, the faith of Abraham. Abraham believed God. It was a personal walk with God. And God is calling us out of the superficial. And really, the Laodicean effect, and we, we see this in, in Revelation. Now, there's several ways of reading uh, the churches in Revelation. <coughs> Many believe that they actually talk about uh, different eras in the church, and you can actually go back, marry over church history, and lay down the situations, and it will actually it will actually fit with a block of church history. And in fact, in the exact order. At the same time, I think that there, I think we're still dealing with the Jezebel spirit and the doctrine of Balaam and all the things that Jesus warns the church about. But the Laodicean church, Laodicea was a very affluent area. Uh, that was uh, very wealthy for the dyes and the garments that they could produce and all this stuff. And wealth can mimic spirituality. And I think that's one of the reasons in the Western world, our affluence has weakened our faith. Mm-hmm. It okay? has. Now, we've come to trust in it. <laughs> we've come to trust in it. And, guys, it can be taken away tomorrow. Yeah. But what the kingdom of God on the inside of you cannot be taken away. Okay, and we we have a lot of brothers and sisters that live overseas that are and they may only have a Bible. That's all they have. And, and, and you know, we we have this plethora of books and tapes and videos and all these different things, and they're deeper in their faith than we are. That they don't have to have all these things to be happy. They have Jesus. You know, yesterday I I had. Um, while I was doing some stuff in the office, I, I on iTunes, I guess, set up where they kind of created this little radio station for me. And then the, that old hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I found myself crying over that because the church in America 
wants Jesus and the silver and gold. They yeah. want they want the fame untold. They want when all we need is Jesus. That's right. That's right. And the depth of Jesus far outweighs what's in him. The riches that are in him far outweigh anything that this world could ever give you. Guys. Now, Jesus is writing this, speaking to John. It says, picking up in verse 14 of Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich. White garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I bless and give warm fuzzies. Is that what the Bible says no. there, Mary? It says, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Guys, when you when you look at, there, this is an area that was known for producing the finest garments in the ancient world. And Jesus said, you think you're clothed, but you're naked. Yeah. Because when we, when we read further on in the book of Revelation, it talks about these people, at more than you can count, coming out of great tribulation, and their robes have been made white. Mm -hmm. And wh that white is derived from the righteous acts of the saints. Mm -hmm. That their faith held up under tribulation. Well, look, see, at, look at what Hollywood does, sweetheart. Yeah. Look at how you know they sell their souls sometimes to Satan for the wealth and things like that. And, of course, part of the time they are naked. <laughs> they have less clothes out Literally. there than... Than anywhere, but but I mean they that's the importance that has been placed on the on the money. Yeah. You know, I, I looked this up in um I like Adam's Adam Adam Clark's commentary is a good basic introductory commentary for those who ever get one. Uh, a lot of times you can get it digitally for free because it's so old. Uh but Adam Clark was fluent in all the biblical languages. He was a protege of John Wesley. Uh, and he says here in, in uh, for th uh, 3 and 17, he says, I am rich. Thou suppose thyself to be in a safe state, perfectly sure of final salvation, because thou hast begun well and laid the right foundation. It was this most deceitful conviction that cut the nerves of their spiritual diligence. They rest in what they have already received and seem to think that once in grace must still be in grace. Now, he was an Armenianistic compared to the opposite of a Calvinist. But the Bible over and over again, Mary says, he who holds out to the end shall be saved. Now, when Calvin looks at it and says, well, those that are saved will hold out to the end, and the Armenian says those that hold out to the end will be saved. But what that's talking about really is having the depth to hold out no matter what. Mm-hmm. Having endurance. Having endurance. And then he begins examining the Greek words, thou art wretched, most wretched. The word signifies according to Minerta, being worn out and, and fatigued from grievous labor as they who labor in a stone qu uh, quarry are, are condemned to the mind. So instead of being children of God as they supposed and infallible heirs of the kingdom, they were in the sight of God in the condition of the most abject slaves. Mm. Their, uh, their affluence, God looked at that and said, you're a slave to the world system around you. Mm -hmm. You're a slave to what it can give you. And let me tell you something. The world never, ever gives you anything that it does not extract at least a pound of flesh. Oh, for sure. Never. He goes on to say, miserable, the most deplorable, to be pitied, pitied of all men, poor, having no spiritual riches, no holiness of heart, rich and poor are sometimes used by the rabbis to express the righteous and the wicked. Blind, 
the eyes of thy understanding being darkened so that thou dost not see thy state. Now, what's interesting, too, is some commentators believe that there was also a world-famous eye salve that was made out in Laodicea. Mm. That was kind of the medical things that they had done. That's interesting. And Jesus saying, you know, you're blind. You need to get your eye salve from me. Mm. Let me heal and restore your eyes oh, so that you can right. see uh, the condition you're in. And naked without the image of God, without the image of God, not clothed with holiness and, and purity, a more, guys, how much have we trusted in doctrines that don't hold water? You know, Mary, I look at, you know, there's, there's scriptures where God says, you know, you have cisterns that won't hold water. And there are a lot of theological sound bites that people are trying to believe in that just don't hold the water. They don't hold the anointing. They, um, I, I have been at conferences where I, you know, you over the years I've trained ministers, and they will then I ask a question and they give me a theological sound bite, and I challenge the sound bite. Okay, now show me where that is in the word and what does that really mean? How does that set back in context into the chapter that you just quoted from me? And they get angry. There, there's no depth there. Don't, don't examine the veneer because the veneer is pretty. And it sounds really good. But the Bible says that we need to be ready, Mary, in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that's within us. Mm -hmm. Okay? That means that we have got to be able to explain it. Now, we find in the book of Hebrews... And this, this is talking about, let me, let me, let me set the, the, this place in the book of Hebrews back in context. Israel were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them without ever them having to lift a finger. That There was not a single spear lifted. There was not a single sword lifted. He poured out nine judgments and judged the nine main gods of Egypt and brought one of the mightiest nations at that time in the earth to its knees, brought them to the Red Sea, and the mountain that they were facing was the original God, the original Baal that was over Egypt. And it was like, you know, tipping the hat to him before he left, before they left, and it was in front of that God, that God, the almighty God, drowned the army of Pharaoh, mm -hmm. Okay. They go through all of that, and they get to Mount Sinai, and they, and they, and they see the fire of God fall on, they, uh, on the mountain. They hear the voice of God, and it is so strong and so powerful that as a nation, they back up and say, just talk to Moses. Whatever he says, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We're afraid that, that this is such a terrifying experience that if you keep on talking to us, it's going to kill us. That's the level of power they saw with God. They were fed manna supernaturally. God created a cloud over them every single day to cool them as a canopy. At night, there was a supernatural pillar of fire that kept them warm in the desert. And if you've ever been in a desert, it can get real hot, and it can get all the way down past freezing at night. God created basically a cocoon for them, yeah, it was. transporting them through. And then they get to the River Jordan. God says, now, instead of just doing it for you, I want to do it with you and through you. And they said no. Not only did they say no, they said, you know what? You brought us here so that these giants could kill our kids. They made a false accusation against God out of fear. And God said, you know what? You're going to die wandering in the wilderness. These kids are going to go and take yeah, the land, okay? They did, too. <laughs> and so in, in the context of that, that's, that's, that is what Hebrews chapter 4 is referring about. And he says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of us seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to them as well uh, to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Mary, you know what they did? 
They took what God did in the past for granted instead of using it to make their faith deeper. Mm-hmm. I think they were still intertwined with Egypt, too. Yeah. They, they hadn't got it out of them yet. <laughs> no, I hadn't got it out of them yet. And I think we had a lot of the believers in the church today has, haven't got Babylon and Egypt out of them yet. We're a similar either. place. We really are. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, uh, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter in it, And those to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David today, after such a long time as it has been said, today if you will hear his voice and do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the the same example of disobedience. Mm -hmm. And so here we have, and I I tend to believe that the, the writer of the book of Hebrews was Paul. In fact, there's some evidence that it was connected to the book of Galatians. At one time, he was basically, the book of Galatians dealt with the damage that the Shammai Pharisees were doing uh, among the Gentiles and correcting that. In fact, when the, he talks about the, the works of the law, uh, there, there is now archaeological evidence that was actually a book written by the Shammai Pharisees for the Gentiles called the book of the works of the law. Okay, it wasn't actually, it made, there is a good chance it wasn't referring to the books of Moses, but the books the Shammai Pharisees were saying, Here's how you walk like a Jew. Okay, this, this, this is everything we expect of you to include circumcision to be saved. Okay, all of this was there. And in the, in, the, in the midst of all that, we have him then writing and correcting the Shammai Pharisees, as well as the things that were going on among those that were now renouncing Jesus and going back into the synagogue. And he was saying, listen, you can fall short. You can fall short because you're not mixing faith with what you're hearing. You know, when, and Mary, when we think of faith, we think of it as some vaporous, floaty kind of thing that uh, is almost a mystery. And it's, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's what we think. But when you look at the Greek word, uh, pistis in the in the Greek, Mary, it's a noun, okay? And a noun is a person, place, or thing. That faith is concrete. And when I looked it up in BDAG, which is the abbreviation for a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, it ranges from that which invokes trust and faith in the state of uh, being someone in whom confidence can be placed Faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, and commitment. Faith is tangible. Faith is the currency of heaven. It's an act. It, it, it's, it's an act because of something that is real in your life. It's mm-hmm. not a feeling. It moves no. so far. You know, it's like this. Uh, we're sitting here today, and, and uh, the podcasting equipment is sitting on a oak table. Okay. That's tangible. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't change the reality of that table. Mm-hmm. Now, I can deny its existence, but it still doesn't change anything. Faith is real. It is something that we can increase. Every, the Bible says everyone has been given the measure of faith in the book of Romans. So every one of us, the day that we were born again, that the faith that God has saved that was given to us by the Holy Spirit, every single one of us got the same measure. But 
faith, Jesus kept on referring to as a seed that can grow. Just like the oak trees that, that made this table grew and become larger. And so it's something tangible. It is something that can grow. And I, you know, I remember uh, thinking back at there were some pivotal times in our lives. And I remember one of them, we were living down on D Highway. And guys, we, we were driving a vehicle that had more rust than steel. Okay. And that uh, was, I mean, that was, let me just explain some of the stuff that we went through. Because we, we'd been married a year. And I had uh, purchased a, a new vehicle, and on our anniversary, first anniversary, you rolled that on black and ice destroyed. with then her dad there, in the car with me. Then there was uh, my mom and dad um, bought a, an older car and gave gave that to us, and you were crossing a railroad track and something caught on it and bent the frame and destroyed it. Then we finally, <laughs> I mean, it was guys, yeah. if you. We could see what we were going through at that time. Part of the the immense attack, I can see now what it was. I was never supposed to leave Fort Leonard Wood. When I, when I was pregnant with Lisa, I I wanted to to stay home, um, and be with her. You know, I knew, um, I just knew in my heart that that was supposed to be. Well, when I put in my notice at Fort Leonard Wood, you talk about a change, and it was like everything. Every kind of pressure that was there was placed on us um, to try to get me back to Fort Leonard Wood. I even had them call me and offer me a position. Which is never done. Um, and so this was all of hell trying to get me back to a place where I could remain programmed is what it was. And so, I mean, the, the financial struggles with Mike. Mike got out of the military and nobody wanted to hire him because of his education level because they knew that he wasn't going to stay there. I mean, it was just one thing after another. We were trying to tie, tie the best that we could, and it just it, there was doctor bills. There was just one thing after another. And, and some of you might be going through that right now. Well, if you are, that means that the enemy's worried about you. Yeah, He's worried about something you don't see. That he he has some kind of of knowledge of what's ahead. Maybe the anointing he can detect on you. Maybe it's angels that are around you. Um, but I can tell you, he he beelines those he's he's worried about. And he God does. brought us through. I mean, there never was a time we went without food. I, I remember you were you were feeding a family of four on twenty five dollars a week, and everything came in an always saves can, which. Uh, meant that our ketchup was the consistency of tomato juice. <laughs> well, I, I, the only <laughs> option I had is I got the sales paper, and I would plan the meals around what I could get as the cheapest. That's just how it was. And and all the church was was into the prosperity gospel. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it looked like we were the biggest failures that ever. You ever know, walked. you you believe God, you t- you sow, you you tithe, and and you're going to become rich. I mean, that was the mantra. Mm-hmm. And, and it I was re- like you, there was something wrong with you if you weren't. Yeah. I mean, you were defective. You. Were- and I remember, again, it was that old Buick that I had. And, I mean, you could. You could well, hear you coming for a mile. There you, was something wrong with you. You could hear me coming for a country mile. And, <laughs> and when it rained, the floorboards were full of water. And, and I was driving that thing, and I was so mad. You know, it's like, you know, what am I, am I defective? What's going on? Your word's not working. And uh, it was during those times, Mary, you and I made a commitment. God, if you never provide another dime, if you don't, if you don't change this situation yeah, we're around, we're not going to leave you. <laughs> we're not leaving you. No, nope. your word is true, every single word of it, and, it's and we we're believe doing it. Wrong. <laughs> and if there's anything that's that's a problem, it's me, not you. And you know, I look at those things and I see them as turning points. They were they were tests. Yeah, they were that we were that we were passing that strengthened our faith. Uh, and you know, I even look now that. You know, God is calling us with what He's calling us to do over at the uh, over at the center, and it's daunting. It, it's daunting, even when, even when we get it done, it's going to be daunting to do what God's calling us to do over there. And but what I know, I, we what know, I, He's called us. I, we, I know He's called us. And what I begin doing is I go over all the stuff He's already brought us through. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, and He's He's got a plan. I trust in His plan totally. Yeah. 
And, you know, I sit sometimes at night, guys, sitting there thinking in my head, cooking in my head and figuring out, okay, now I can fix these things way ahead of time and and we're going to have freezers so I can have this frozen and, um, you know, fixing the food thing. But the the most important thing to me is having a place where God moves. I want him to be free to move in there, to to have an environment created where he's honored and um, revered. revered. And, you know, it's... It's hard to get in this in this time because we've been moved in the churches far away from it, I believe. And you know what? Like we said before, the Hebraic Roots Movement, um, those initial truths of that we've left God's ways are so important and how you've taught all the different things, the feasts. and But my word, Mike, has there been an infiltration there and taking it to a place to where an average Christian in a denominational church would, would look at that and say, this is crazy. And not even look at it, and yeah. so so we've got to ask God for balance. We've got to ask Him step by step what to do. I just want what He wants. Yeah, no. I don't have an agenda because I don't know anything. To have I, an I agenda still think about. I still think <laughs> of the interview that I was doing with uh, John Gar, and uh, he he comes out and says, "Listen, if you're doing Jewish roots and Hebrew roots, and it's not making you a kinder, gentler person, filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit." brings you closer to God, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I mean, John has just a matter of fact way of, of saying things when he needs to. Well, and I've, and got, I've got testimony from lots of people that have been in certain groups and what's going on. And it it's important we hang on to this, but we've got to have a place where there's the balance of it taught or we're going to be in, as ineffective as everything yeah. else. And I think that's what we try to do with, with our ministry uh, and and uh, I, I try to stay keenly aware to stay balanced mm-hmm. and not go over. You know, what uh, what caused the children of Israel at Jordan to say no? Remember they sent the 12 spies over? Yeah. You know, this, this is found in uh, Numbers chapter 13. And Joshua and Caleb came back, and I mean, they were stoked. And I mean, they, yeah, they brought, <laughs> they brought. can you imagine one bunch of grapes that you had to put on a stave and it took two men to carry? I mean, that's some grapes. Yeah. Now, you, you, can have, you can have a lot of Welch's grape juice out of well, that. Well, they, they saw provision ahead, but there was a fight to get there. It was a fight to get there. And they're, they're saying, you know what? God brought Pharaoh down. We didn't even have to lift a finger. Man, what's going to happen when we pick up a sword? I mean, there's going to be fur flying, you know, because we're, we're serving Almighty God. This is nothing. We're more than able to take the land. And you had 10 that had not been meditating, Mary, on everything that God had done. Mm-hmm. It okay. scared them. <laughs> and uh, the Bible says they gave an evil report. And it says in... And they gave the children of Israel a bad, or the King James says, evil report of the land, and they spied out, saying, the land, though which we have gone, as spies this land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw. In it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers, and this, this is the problem, in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. It was their... their thought and their interpretation of what they were you see you and i by ourselves we can't do a thing we can't we can't but with god we can't see we're in blood covenant Mm -hmm. we're in covenant with the creator of the universe who spoke the universe into existence Mm -hmm. out of absolutely nothing there was nothing and he spoke it and there was something you know that that's something that nobody can do you want, you want to talk about faith. Well, Mike, it takes great faith to believe that. What about the Big Bang Theory, that all the matter in the known universe was this little speck. It had compressed all the way down to the place where it was the size of a marble, and then it all exploded into reality. That thing would have had to have been so super dense that it would, have, it would have become a black hole. The gravity of it would have been impossible for it to have even exploded. So which one takes more faith? This is, we serve a God who can part the Red Sea. We serve mm-hmm. a God who can say to a storm, peace, be still. That's right. We serve a God that can say, Lazarus, come forth, and the grave cannot hold the guy down. We serve a God 
that can absolutely the impossible is his everyday meals that he does. It's possible for him. There is yeah. nothing impossible for him to do except to lie and to do evil. Mm-hmm. That's the God that we have to serve. You know, I remember then the, this. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans, and this is out of Romans four eighteen. It's it's and uh, through twenty two talking about Abraham, who says, "Who contrary to hope." in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a 100 years old. Mary, I'm glad that God's not calling us to have a kid at about 100 years old. Oh, me and you both. (laughs) The animals that we take care of is enough, you know. Uh, He said, nor even the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was counted, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, how did he get there? Because when you read the life of Abram, he didn't start out that way. God saw the potential, called him out of Babylon, and begin working on him. But, you know, there was, there was one time that God came to him, Mary, and he said, listen, I'm going to cut a covenant with you, and your descendants are going to be more than the stars that you can count in the sky or the grains of sand that you can count while he was sitting in the desert. You want to talk about some visual props. Well, that's what I was thinking. He could look up, he could look down. And, and so every time he either looked up or looked down, he was meditating mm-hmm. on the promise of God. That's right. And, you know, there were a lot of things that uh, he could have meditated on, past failures. I don't know how God's going to use me. I used to, not only did I make idols, I promoted false worship of, of fallen angels in Babylon. That was my family business that for gen- for at least two generations we know of that they did it. We don't know before that, if maybe his grandfather was involved too, the word of God is silent on that. But he could have dwelt on the past instead of the promise of God. He could have dealt on, on the mistakes he made with Pharaoh and, and saying, you know, that my wife's my sister. And I mean, there was, that, was, that was a fumble by Abram. That's but, a you trap know, we could fall into right now easily, any of us. Oh, any of us. And one of the things I have found out, once you really start taking your walk with God seriously, Mary, God does something unexpected. He knows where we're going to end up. He knew that Abram one day was going to become Abraham. And in the midst of the Pharaoh debacle, he started treating Abram as if he was Abraham. Mm -hmm. He gave him supernatural favor in that entire situation. And he walked walked out of Egypt a rich man. And there's, there's... if if you and I will think about it, and if all of us will think, there we can we can mark times in our lives that God treated us as if we were already somebody that He promised that only through Him we could be. He showed up when He shouldn't have showed up. He did something when He didn't have to do something. He He released grace when He didn't have to release grace. And Abraham gets to this pivotal time that he's getting ready to offer up Isaac. Okay, now he believes for this kid, Mary. God gives him this kid. And then God says, I want you to go up to, up to the mountain, and I want you to offer that child as a sacrifice to me. Now, he's already prophesying when he goes up there. He says, God will provide for himself a lamb. Mm-hmm. Now, when you read the story, eventually God provided a lamb, not a ram. That's why Israel was always looking for the lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And when John the Baptist cried out, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. But in the moment, God cried out to him, Abram, Abram. And it said in the angel Lord cried out to him a second time from heaven and saying, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your child your only child, 
Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And your descendants, now listen to this, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Mm-hmm. Guys, open your hearts right now and listen. The day that you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you became part of the sand mm-hmm. and a part of the stars. That's right. You became a part of it. You're connected to Abram because right. he was willing to give his only begotten son on an altar for God because he was in blood covenant with God. It opened the door for almighty God to come and give his only begotten son and marry what they have discovered archaeologically it was in the exact same place the cross hung that the altar was built. The exactness yeah. of God. The meticulous nature of yeah. Almighty That's God. Right. That's right. That on that same spot he gave his son, the Lamb of God, was given. But Mary, he said something. He said, the gates of your enemy will be yours. You see, there was a day that Jesus took his disciples to Mount Hermon. That's ground zero for Genesis 6. That's where the watchers fell. The fortress in Nimrod is there. The entrance to Hades is there, all of that. And he says this, And when Jesus came into a certain region of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he has asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, and some one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, and blessed art thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father also, which is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the what? And the gates of of hell will not prevail against it. That promise was given to Abraham. That's right. Your (laughs) descendants, your descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. It's going to happen. Now, my goodness, how do we get there? You know, imagine all the time that Abram was looking at the sea or the sand on the seashore and he was looking at the stars and saying, that's my family. That's what God's given me. God named me the father of nations. Mm -hmm. He changed my name. He could have meditated on the past, but he didn't. The failures of the past, he meditated on all the things that God brought him through. That's right. Which built his faith for what God was going to do. And we're in a situation today, the devil constantly wants you to meditate on your past failures, the past failures of others around you. It keeps you at a prison, Mary, doesn't it? It does. It builds It builds a spiritual prison. It builds <laughs> a spiritual prison. It builds a prison that keeps you from moving in faith. In other words, you're building more faith in the devil than you are in God. Mm-hmm. And it's manifested as fear. Or we can meditate on the things that God has brought us through. That's right. Which causes confidence in the things he has promised that he's going to do. We are going to possess the gates yes, we will. of hell. That's right. They're not going to prevail against God's people. Guys, whatever comes... We're going to make it. Yes, we are. And God's going to make us stronger. But there has to be a paradigm shift that we start doing the things that take us beyond the veneer because the Holy Spirit, when he, when he gets involved in our lives and you look like you're this beautiful, solid oak table, he doesn't want veneer. He doesn't want that cheap particle board underneath. He wants to work yeah. a miracle in your life. That you're a tree of righteousness all the way through, not one just pretending. 
And guys, it's this time for us to begin building up our holy faith. Meditating, refuse to meditate on past failures. Choose to meditate. We have control of our minds. Mm -hmm. That is, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And all this happens between your ears. Why? Because it says, bringing every thought into captivity. Mm -hmm. Bringing everything. You know, Abram, he had to work on being strong in faith because when you're 100, you know, I'm 61 now. And uh, you can tell that the warranty is starting to wear out on some stuff. You know, I can't imagine being a hundred and thinking, I'm going to have a kid. I'm going to have a kid. I'm going to. But he could, but the Bible says he did not consider his own body now dead, but he, he was strong in faith and believed God. Mm -hmm. Enough so that when God told him to sacrifice his son, he knew that that promise was going to be fulfilled, that that w that he, they yeah. would have descendants. So he knew God had a plan. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he had already in a vision saw Isaac raised from the dead, which is amazing since there had no been no such thing as a resurrection. Mm -hmm. I I think it I think that all that happened when Melchizedek came and shared in the mystery of the bread and the wine. In fact, Carl Koch can do a, a, a such an outstanding job of taking apart the Hebrew when he was going to sacrifice Isaac. At that moment, God opened his eyes, and he saw the cross. Mm -hmm. It's in the Hebrew, and it was that day that Abram got saved. God can set you free. Man right. can't. No, but Jesus God can. paid the price. Jesus alone paid the price. He alone has the keys. And he can can make us beyond our past. That's right. Well, Father, I pray for every person that listens to this podcast. Father, I speak freedom yes, to those that are in captive. Jesus name. I say that you are freed from your past in the name of Jesus, and it was what the enemy was doing. But God is setting you free from it because he has a future for you that is far yes. better than your past. Breaking every curse that came with it. Break Breaking every curse, curses. break Strong every chain, break fallen. every lie. They're fallen and fallen in Jesus' name. And, Father, that you would release an anointing for freedom yes. and for growth. The Apostle Paul says we need to think on these things. We need to think on things that are good, things that are just. We need to think on who you are what you brought us through. And even in the mess that we have, may have went through hell itself, the devil didn't kill us. That's he right. couldn't kill us because God said, you're going to make it through because I have something in store for you. And every prison that's been built by the enemy or by people and their words, we possess the gates right now. We command the gates to come open. We command the past and all of its, the kingdom of darkness that had a part in it, it's got to go. Yes. It cannot stay. And we lose the power of the kingdom of God for every prison to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Father, Bondage, break healing. Break, and anointing. break restoration. Father, let us be like the Apostle Paul that he said, uh, I've let go of the things of the past, mm -hmm. but I press on to the prize of my high calling. Yes. Oh, Lord. Let us speak victory to those around us. Let us speak your truth to those around us. Let us speak who they can be to those around us. And let us speak that to ourselves. Let us be yes. so bold as to believe the word and not the circumstances, not the feelings. Faith transcends feelings mm -hmm. and brings the impossible into the everyday. Yes. And Father, we thank you. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Kerr, co-founder of Hear the Watchman. And I'd like to join in with Dr. Michael Lake in inviting you to come out to Grapevine, Texas, March 17th through the 20th for our Eyes to See conference. It is the first time that we've been able to gather together again and worship and learn and just be blessed by the speakers who are, who are going to be there to share with you. Those would be 
none other than Dr. Michael Lake, Jamie Walden, Pastor Paul Begley, Derek Gilbert, L.A. Marzulli, Dr. Michael Lake, Dave Hodges, Thomas Dunn, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, Ohio Brett, John and Chelsea Jubilee, and yours truly, Mike and Jeannie Kerr. So get out and get involved. Come out and let's gather again and fellowship and pray together. There's nothing like it. Please go to www.hearthewatchmenmen.com and sign up today. We have discounted hotel rooms available. It's just a wonderful experience. And use the promotional code LAKE20 and save $20 off the price of your ticket to attend the conference. We'll see you all in Grapevine, Texas. Thank you so much, and God bless each and every one of you.